Hey, uh, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And this is a Bible church because all of you are grabbing a Bible. Amazing. Amazing. Like Zev said, I live in California and... Uh, I do love California. It's often sunny and warm, which is a blessing uh, to my wife and I. And uh, I'm a pastor. I also uh, am the founder of a nonprofit called Better Days, and we talk about all things mental health and suffering uh, in Christianity. Chris, good to see you, man. Um, and uh, yeah, we've gone through some really hard stuff in our lives, my wife and I. And uh, also, the way that God wired me in my education, I just have felt for many years just a call to write and teach and podcast. Our podcast uh, has reached people in almost 100 countries and thousands of cities across the U.S. Uh, because I think this is a moment that people are feeling collective weight and brokenness. Um, and also a moment in Christianity where people want to understand how to walk through the hard things of life and follow Jesus in the midst of that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings around mental health and suffering in Christianity. I think there's some voices out there that are helping to uh, build a healthy theology and a language around these experiences so that we can talk about this stuff in church. Because as of the last couple of years, uh, 70 to 80 plus percent of people in America are struggling with depression and anxiety. 70 to 80 percent, which means every Sunday people come into church, over half the church is trying to process some heavy, complex reality of being human in a broken world. So this morning, um, I want to talk to you about Romans 8, uh, how to process through and walk through disappointment. You guys ready for that? Romans 8, how to process through, walk through disappointment. And we'll pick up in verse 18 uh, in a few minutes. Jesus, what a blessing to be here this morning. We just pause in the midst of life and family and our own complexity and sufferings and disappointments and shame and pain and everything that we experience as humans and we just bring it honestly and openly to you this morning, God. And I ask that you would meet each one of us here in a unique way, just the way that we need this morning. And not just individually, God, I, I pray that you'd be present, but also as a community, the story, Ashton, what an amazing church in this city at this moment of time. I pray that you would bless this church and that you would speak to us your people gathered here this morning as a community teaching us from Scripture how to walk through moments of disappointment. We love you. We worship you. We bow our hearts and our lives before you. And we open up our hearts and our, open up our Bibles to you this morning. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. There are days that you and I wake up as humans and we ultimately say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I remember uh, my junior year in high school, uh, I was a basketball player and I loved playing basketball and I was doing really well um, and uh, was getting actually some letters of recruitment. I had a couple of large schools that were starting to send me letters, which is amazing. That's what you want when you're a high school athlete. Um, and I remember, it was like maybe like the seventh, eighth, ninth game into the season. It was the first quarter, and I drove past this guy like five or six times in a row and scored. And that's good for the first quarter. Like you score like 10 or 12 points early in the first quarter, like that's a really good thing. And uh, my last time going up to score on this guy, I drove past him. He like knocked my legs from under me, and I fell down leaning backwards and shattered my elbow. And at that point in my life, basketball was everything. It was my hope, it was my identity, it was everything that I was looking forward to in life. And my, my uncle was a doctor, so I went to his office the next morning, he did imaging, he sent me right away to what he said was the best orthopedic surgeon in the city. 
I went directly to his office from my uncle's office. It was across the street. And uh, he did more imaging, looked at the injury, and he said, you might not ever be able to play again. This is a serious injury to your shooting elbow. And I remember like sitting in the midst of that for a couple months, feeling just the weight of depression and disappointment. And I felt like my hopes and dreams were being shattered because by the time you hit your junior year, that is, that's the time that recruitment really sp- speeds up and larger colleges, universities uh, really pick out, choose certain players that they really want to identify and look at over the next couple of years. And I was just sitting in the midst of this deep, deep disappointment thinking this was not the way the story was supposed to be. A couple months back, uh, I had got home from work and I was sitting on my couch reading a book and I love to read. It fills up my soul. And like some of you do the same thing and, and being alone and reading a book, that's like the best thing ever. And I was sitting on my couch reading this book, and I placed my phone to the side because I like to take like digital breaks during the day because uh, we hibernate on our phones way too much in our culture. And so my phone was like across the couch, and I noticed as I was reading this book that it was notifying me over and over and over again that there were text messages. But I'm like, oh, you know, like that's normal for me. I get text messages all the time. So I just didn't pay attention to my phone. I was reading this book, and eventually I got up, and I opened up my phone and opened up the messages, and basically there was a number of messages that said, hey, something really bad happened to a family member. He was murdered. And I remember just the week that ensued talking to different family members and processing that and eventually flying out for the funeral, and I thought to myself, This is not the way that God created the world to be. And many of us, we understand that. The moments of human suffering, the feelings of disappointment that as we process through the complexities and the hardships of life, and sometimes we're not able to articulate exactly what we're feeling, but ultimately what we're trying to say is, This is not the way it's supposed to be. Unfulfilled expectations, a sadness about our current realities, moments we think, life, all that I imagined, all that I hoped for, all that I dreamed for, this is not the way it's turning out to be. There are many moments of disappointment in life when we lose someone that we love, when relationships don't work out, when we walk through health challenges that change the trajectory of our life, when we enter our career with excitement and hope and we're like, this is the pinnacle, this is everything that I've been working toward, and then when we get into it, we realize, oh my goodness, the challenges are plentiful. When we're in the midst of parenting and it's hard and it's disappointing and we are exposed to our own weaknesses and challenges as parents, when marriage is not the fairy tale that we once thought it would be. And ultimately, the last two years in our cultural moment, when we walk through a global pandemic and everything in our lives and our world is thrown into upheaval. This is life. This is the reality. This is the atmosphere in which we live in, and we feel these disappointments. And Paul, the writer of Romans 8, understood suffering and disappointment. In fact, in this pinnacle chapter that we're going to look at a number of verses, Paul is talking about how we change, how we are transformed to become like Jesus in our discipleship to Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, he talked about how the cross changes us. Jesus' death on the cross doesn't just have a redemptive aspect in the the sense that we're made right with God. It has a redemptive aspect in the sense that the cross literally changes us. And then Romans chapter 7, how the law cannot change us. No matter how much we try to obey the law apart from the Spirit of God and Jesus, we cannot truly become like Christ with the law as our power and our source. And then Romans chapter 8 teaches us how the Spirit of God changes us. And in the midst of how the Spirit of God forms us into the image of Christ, there's a major section on the reality of suffering. 
And he talks about future hope, what we look forward to, but he also talks about present reality, what we live in currently. Notice with me, Romans chapter 8, picking up at verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing. So he's looking forward to the future with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Here's our present reality. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Now verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present moment. Not only so, but we ourselves who have, gro- who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know how we ought to pray for, or how we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Notice the third time that term groan has been used. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And then, verse 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All of that All of that context is framed in suffering. How there is weakness and future hope and yet present struggles and challenges. And and, and in the midst of this, there's just such brutal honesty and humanness looking toward hope but leaning into our present reality and realizing that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, prays for us in our weakness, and that ultimately, verse 28, God works good even in suffering. But I want you to notice a few things that we often miss in Romans chapter 8, particularly in this section. First of all, in verse 22, write this down, number one, creation groans. And you're like, what does that mean? He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. This is an interesting section because I always tell people that the Bible is much more honest than we are sometimes. Like the Bible leans into reality and vulnerability and and just paints a really honest picture of life. And part of this section, he's talking about two things. He's talking about humans living in this world, but he's also talking about all of creation that God created. And if you go back to the story of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, basically God creates this world and everything was good, which means everything was functioning just the way that God designed it to function. But we don't live in that reality. We live in a post-Genesis 3 reality. We live in a world where creation, all of this beauty and harmony that God created in creation is groaning awaiting a time of redemption. Now, the term groaning here is interesting. In the original language, Koine Greek, uh, it's sustenazo. And it's an interesting term. Uh, I'll read to you a couple definitions. Freiburg, who's an amazing uh, scholar of Koine Greek, he said this, it means to sigh or groan together. In other words, collectively, all of creation is groaning as when all share pain in common. Metaphorically, it speaks of creation pictured as anxiously awaiting its time for regeneration or redemption. Another writer said it means to groan or to lament. We're going to make that connection in a minute. And then one more writer says in the New Testament, sighing or groaning takes place by reason of state of oppression, where, where there's 
some sort of oppression taking place which causes suffering and from which there is a desire to be free. Don't you ever feel that? You feel this weight. You feel this pressure of suffering. And deep down, you groan because you want to feel relief. You want to be free from it. And ultimately, what Paul is saying is that all of non-human creation is in a state of decay. Plant life, animals, the ocean, the atmosphere, the planets, the stars, everything that God created is in a state of decay. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I love cacti and succulents. Anybody like cacti and succulents here? Yes, I love you guys. Like, we're a team. We're a squad right here. I love cacti and succulents, and it's become like a therapy to me. Like, when I'm super stressed, I'll uh, buy some new cacti and succulents, and I'll plant them and spend time, like, making them look kind of cool and putting, like, cool colored sand over it. Um, It's a really cool thing. And when it's done, I'm, like, so stoked. But here's the problem. I can't keep them alive. (laughs) And every time that I'm in this process of like, oh, another one died. It was so beautiful and brimming with life and and I can't keep it alive. I do not have a green thumb for sure. Maybe you could teach me. But that always reminds me that everything is in a state of decay. The second thing he says, verse 23, not only is creation groaning, but we groan. Not only so, but we ourselves, humans in creation, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, the Spirit of God lives in us, we groan inwardly as we eagerly await the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We groan. Like, God is giving you permission to say, I'm disappointed. I realize this is not the way that it was intended to be. You have the permission to express yourself in the midst of undesirable, disappointing circumstances in life. You know the beauty about this term, stenazo here, which is in the family of the former term? Three times this familial term is used in this section, including the Spirit of God himself groaning on our behalf. Jesus uses this. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 32 to 35, there's a story of Jesus healing a man who was deaf. And as he was approaching this man in the midst of trying to heal him, the Bible says before he healed him, Jesus let out a groan. And I always thought, why did Jesus do that? Like why in the midst of healing this man, a miracle, bringing back the harmony of healing which God intended for this person originally before the fall, why would Jesus groan? Here's why. Jesus was groaning because he saw the repercussions and permeation of human suffering. And he just wanted to express himself. And sometimes in Christianity, we try to suppress expressing ourselves in the midst of human suffering. In in fact, this term is also used in the book of Job. Now, most of us, we evade the book of Job until we have to read it. Because it's a book about suffering and pain and hardship and depression and lament. This word is also used in Lamentations, a book about deep grief in life. And then Paul uses it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where he talks about how everyone kind of is collectively groaning and burdened in our earthly state. So what does this mean? It means this is an expression that Sometimes in life, we have the ability and openness and honesty to say, this is not the way God designed the world to be. Human groaning is an audible expression of life in a post-Genesis 3 broken, fragile world where we have disease, where we have depression, where we have anxiety, where we have poverty and racism and fractured relationships and sin and trauma, where we have all of this existence of things that are wrong and not right, uh, not good, the opposite of good, all the things that God did not intend, but sin and walking away from God infected and permeated the world with all of these disappointments. And God says, 
you have permission to be disappointed. You have permission to honestly say, God, this is not the way you intended it to be. But here's the question. How do we move forward with our disappointments and moments of suffering? How do we not become paralyzed by our disappointments in this post-Genesis 3 reality that we live in? And how do we move from a place of disappointment to a place of hope in Jesus? And sometimes that's a hard line to, to kind of figure out. It's a hard path to walk through. And I believe that the answer to this is partly found in kind of the picture that we've seen painted here in Romans chapter 8. But ultimately, I think the answer to this is found in this Old Testament ancient word and practice that we've kind of forgot about. It's called lament. And it was something that takes up quite a lot of space in the Old Testament, something that the people of God did in the Old Testament and Jesus and various people did in the New Testament. Let me just preface it by saying this. We have learned many unhealthy responses to suffering and disappointment in our culture. In our culture, and even in the church and Christianity, we respond to suffering and disappointment in four main ways. And you can write these things down if you're a note taker. And if you're not a note taker, you can write them down anyways. <laughs> They're super helpful. Number one, number one, hiding. Hiding says, I don't want to see my pain. And some of us, that's our response. We've learned that response to disappointment and pain. The second is running. Running says, I don't want to deal with my pain, and I will evade it at all costs. Number three, suppressing. Suppressing says, I'm going to push it down deep inside of me, and hopefully, I'll forget about it. And then the fourth way that we kind of unhealthy response to disappointments and pain is silencing. Silencing says, I'm not going to tell anybody about it, my disappointment, my, my pain, and I'm not going to visibly reveal it to anyone. I'm not going to show anyone that I'm struggling. I'm just going to deal with it in silence. Hiding, running, suppressing, and silencing all are incredibly unhealthy to your soul that God created. So what's the answer? Lament. Lament is the language of human pain and suffering in the Old Testament. Lament essentially is the practice of processing human suffering and disappointments and pain in a spiritually and emotionally healthy manner. And what I love about this is that it allows us to be honest and lean into our reality. It's a language that God gave his people for suffering to give them a healthy direction forward, to enter into our reality and vocalize our human experience. And you're like, okay, how do I do this? Great question. I've got the answer. Let me give you four helpful orientations in lament toward disappointments and suffering in life. Basically, I'm writing a book and I wrote a section on lament and I studied the entire Psalms. 40% of the Psalms are lament. I studied every Psalm of lament in detail. And I kind of, want to come, kind of wanted to come up with kind of categories or orientations of lament and synthesize this large body of literature. And I came up with four. So when we are disappointed, when we're facing the hard stuff of life, there's four things that are surfaced in the Psalms around lament. First of all, write this down. Number one, looking inward. This is amazing because... A lot of churches or culture says don't look inward, but actually the Bible teaches us that our interior life is important in the midst of disappointments. This interior life, this is the space that we feel and we think and we process the hard moments of life. This is where we are aware of what's actually going on inside of us and we're able to articulate it and verbalize it and be vulnerable about it uh, so that we can move forward and not just silence and suppress and evade what's really going on inside of us. And in the midst of our interior life and looking inward, we're able to ask ourselves important questions like, what am I feeling and what are my thought patterns and how am I processing this? And you're like, well, 
Did the psalmist really do this? Yes, listen to these psalms, Psalm 6, 6 and 7. The psalmist says, I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Psalm 13, verse 2. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Psalm 38, 7 and 8. My back, uh, medical condition, is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Psalm 42, verse 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Hope in God. There's this intelligence in the Psalms. This emotional intelligence that they knew what was going on inside of them, and they were able to freely articulate that to God and community. This is healthy and helpful and freeing and so important in the process of of not just staying in the destination of disappointments, but actually walking through it, walking down that road and getting to a place of hope. We have to be honest about what we're facing. We have to be honest about what we're experiencing and we have to be able to articulate it just like the psalmists do. You know, the reason kind of why we started Better Days it's a, it's a hard and painful story. Um, part of the story is around me being a leader and planting a church that grew to over a couple thousand people. Year three, Easter, we had almost 2,500 people. And I was young and had a lot to learn, which is a good thing, right? We all have a lot to learn, even when we're older. But uh, I was facing this reality that I've never faced before, all the pressure and dynamics and systems changing and uh, pressure, pressure to, to continue to make this a healthy church inside and outside and uh, always changing staffing because we were constantly growing and changing our systems because we were constantly growing and trying to figure out how to lead a church and manage 20 employees and all the implications and layers of all of that and study and pastor and counsel and just thing after thing after thing. The demands were so great, they outweighed my capacity, and eventually I got burnt out and I dealt with three years of paralyzing anxiety and panic attacks. And I thought, nobody's really talking about this in Christianity. And when I hear people talking about it, it's like, oh my goodness, that's so like, you're shaming people, you're not actually teaching like a full picture of these realities and complexities, you're just giving cliches and, you know, myopic, you know, solve all answers that actually probably don't solve everybody's issue. You might actually be adding to their pain by your simplistic answers for really complex human experiences. And so these are the things I was processing through. And I was like, oh my goodness, we have to address this in Christianity. And at the same time, my wife, who is beautiful and athletic and amazing, she was in two car accidents and she has lived with incredible pain, had so many surgeries on her spine. And uh, now she has a, a brain condition from an injury, one of her brain, a brain injury from one of her car accidents. And uh, she has a, a major neurological condition where she's losing memory and uh, mental capacities and the ability to process things that you and I would process. And we had just lived in a lot of hardship and pain. And out of this, because of my... Uh, kind of studies and undergraduate and graduate school and just the way that God's wired me and also my experience and our story, I felt God call me to this space and say, okay, you've walked through this. You've learned to be honest about your pain. You, you've realized what this does to your interior life and kind of how to process through it. Now, take all of your studies and your research and being a pastor and being able to communicate and speak into this in Christianity because there's a lot of people that are hurting just like you, Wesley. And sometimes we have to be honest with ourselves so that we can walk through it 
and share about it because when we walk through it and share about it, so many lives could be changed and encouraged and helped with our stories. But it starts with looking inward, being honest. And then the second orientation is looking upward. And I'm going to go a little quicker. I mean, I could talk forever, and you don't want to hear me talk forever. The second one is looking upward. And lament doesn't just look at our interior life. Lament engages with God when suffering. Rather than moving away from God, like we often do in our disappointments, we actually are encouraged to move toward God in an honest way. God invites us in lament to engage honestly with him in our pain, in our disappointments, in our suffering. And guess what? God is not afraid of your honesty. Like you can be brutally honest about your thoughts, your emotions, kind of your struggles, your wrestling, your weakness, whatever it may be in relationship to the hard things that you face in life. And God's not like, oh my goodness, Wesley, don't tell me that. Like that's too much for me. TMI for sure. God is not like that. In fact, as I study the scriptures, God is always pursuing us in our brokenness and inviting us to an honest relationship with him. And that's what God wants from you. In your discouragement, in your disappointments, in the feelings of shame or guilt or whatever it may be, God wants you to open up in the midst of our own human messiness and share with him our thoughts and our emotions and dialogue around our disappointments and our suffering. Dr. Tremper Longman, who's one of the foremost Old Testament scholars, particularly around the Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Solomon, he wrote, in the, darkest, in the darkness, part of me, of our emotional wrestling with God, we grow in our understanding of him. How true that is. Psalm 31, 9 and 10 says, Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my afflictions and my bones grow weak. I love this. He's just like, God help me and here's what I'm feeling and here's my experience and here's what I'm going through. And God is like, yes, you're talking to me honestly, honestly, in description, vivid description about what you're experiencing. Don't run away from God in your disappointments Run to God in your disappointments. Number three, looking inward, looking upward, looking outward. That's the third orientation. Lament does, doesn't teach us to engage with our interior life, and it doesn't just teach us to engage with God when we suffer. It also teaches us to engage with community in the midst of disappointments and suffering. And here's the cool thing. There's 16 corporate laments, where all the people would lament together in the Psalms. But there's 40%, almost half of the Psalms are laments, and all of those, all 40%, uh, were used in the communal worship of Israel. They would sing them together. They would pray them together. They would honestly communicate them together to God. And that's a beautiful thing, because here's the thing about disappointment and suffering. We are not meant to do it alone. In a culture that teaches us to isolate, God teaches us to run to community. In a culture that teaches us the way through it and out of it is to suppress it, God teaches us to open it up in safe human relationships because, like psychology has learned, God already taught us before psychology surfaced this, that every human being needs a safe relational home to process their pain. That's the church. That's the story Ashland, a place where every person can come to their communities or discipleship or groups or, or Sunday and bring our honest selves to God and to community. Not false, not everything's good, I'm so happy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But yes, I'm not saying that's not true, but what I am saying is 
40% of the human experience in the Psalms of worship was not, I'm so happy, everything's good, joy. It was, this is painful, this is hard, and I need you guys to support me, help me, and give me strength along this path that I'm walking through. And this is a place that we can be honest and vulnerable and real, and we can find help, hope, and healing. We need the church. Like more than ever before, where so much fracturing has happened in our culture, so many crises, so much division, we can unify around the person of Jesus, and we can unify around the mission that there is a broken world all around us, including in our own life, and people need hope, and they're going to find hope, help, and healing in God's community. And a few people clapped. (laughs) Number four, looking outward and then finally looking forward. Looking forward. Like lament just doesn't look inward. It doesn't just look upward. It doesn't just look outward. It also looks forward in hope. And this is the first full circle of Romans 8. Romans 8 is like we groan, but we groan with hope. We suffer, but we suffer with hope. And here's the thing about hope in the Bible. Hope is never dismissive of present pain. That's a false hope. That is an unbiblical, uh, anti-theological hope. The hope that always overshadows everything, like you're good, you got God, you're awesome. You're gonna kind of militant hope, like we're gonna conquer this. You know, you don't have to focus on your suffering. That is is not a biblical hope. You don't find that in the Bible. You find things like this. You find things like, wow, it's hard. It's painful. We're groaning. We don't even have the words to articulate what we're going through, but we still have hope in Jesus. We have present pain, but we still have hope in Jesus. We lament, but we lament in hope. And lament is dialoguing with God around present pain and present suffering. And lament also hopes with confidence for future redemption, deliverance, and healing. Because that's also part of our story. Our full, full story is not our disappointments. Our full story is not our present pain. Our full story includes disappointments, includes present pain, but also don't delete the work of Jesus in the midst of everything we are going through and the reality that someday he's going to return us to the Genesis 1 and 2 world where everything is perfect and healed and delivered and redeemed, and that is our future that we hope for as followers of Jesus. But here's the thing about disappointment. It can overtake our identity. It can overtake every view and perspective about life. And it can paralyze us where we're blinded from hope. So God says, look inward, look upward, look outward, and look forward with an honest hope, entering honestly into your pain while looking forward to better days ahead. Listen to the psalmist, Psalm 37, 39. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. That's hope. Psalm 33, 20 through 22. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. You know the coolest thing about all of this? Romans 8, the Psalms of Lament. What Lament teaches us is you see every single bit of this in the cross of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus hung on the cross and he suffered shame publicly, where he was brutally beaten and crucified, and 
where Jesus quoted Psalm 23, 1, a lament of sorrow. You remember on the cross when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting a lament from the Old Testament. So Jesus wasn't like, oh, I'll see you on the other side. Sunday's coming. It's going to be amazing. No, he groaned and he sat there in pain and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he said that in hope. He was honest and he had hope. He entered into his present moment of deep, painful suffering where he became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for you and I that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became that for us, but he still had hope. And that's essentially what Isaiah 53 teaches us when Isaiah 53 is talking about the description of the suffering of Christ on the cross. And then Isaiah 53 says that Jesus on the cross knew what he was doing, and he was looking forward to the resurrection hope that was awaiting him. Can I just speak a word into your life? Your pain is hard. Your disappointment is real. Don't let any cliche or hyper-spiritual answer, you know, kind of cover over and dismiss what you're experiencing. But alongside of that, because of Jesus Christ's suffering and pain, you also have hope in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your disappointments, in the midst of everything you're experiencing and discouraged about in life. You have hope for better days ahead because of Jesus. And in that we place our hope.